I graduated from, uh, with my BS in 66 and uh, immediately went into graduate school. And as things happened, about halfway through the first semester, I was told that my draft notice was either in the mail or was coming shortly. So I scurried down to the Navy recruiting office in Raleigh, North Carolina, and raised my hand and went into the Navy. We went through OCS, and of course it's mainly set up to be a ship driver, a surface warfare officer. And while I knew that would be a good career, I decided that I wanted to be an air intelligence officer. And at that time, they were sending intel officers, air intelligence officers, through flight school in Pensacola and went through essentially the same training as the pilots and the naval flight officers. And uh, when we finish there, uh, they get their wings and the intel officers with no wings go to intelligence uh, training. My preference coming out of the intel school was to try to get into a squadron that had a back seat or a seat that uh, did not require a pilot. So maybe I could fly a little bit. And fortunately, I was able to do that. So I was assigned to VF-213. Uh, the squadron name is the Black Lions. And uh, shortly after we, I joined the squadron, we deployed in the USS Kitty Hawk. And then we uh, went straight to Vietnam via Philippines. And then we went to the Gulf of Tonkin Yankee Station for operations in Vietnam. Two to four carriers with their escorts regularly steam back and forth at Yankee Station at the mouth of the Gulf of Tonkin. Here they stood ready to send strikes against military targets north of the demilitarized zone or to support operations below the zone. All the intelligence officers from the squadrons were assigned to work in IOIC and we briefed the pilots. All the pilots' flight crews would come to IOIC for their pre-flight briefings for weather, for any kind of intelligence, to plan the operations. Uh, so we had quite a full house for, for big missions. And uh, so the intel officers would prepare those briefings and then we would uh, give the briefings. But our job was to gather all of the data from all of these different sources. And we, we used multiple sources. Um, most, many of them the pilots were not even aware of where the data came from. But we would put it all together, sanitize it so that no source was revealed, uh, such as from communications or signal intelligence and that kind of thing, and that would become part of our briefing and part of our briefing package. Well, we were involved in the targeting too. The intelligence uh, people uh, would pick the targets. Sometimes the targets were conveyed from Washington. Uh, in my opinion, too many times, we were told. Uh, much of our operations were in Laos. Uh, we did do some operations in North Vietnam, uh, alpha strikes as they were called. We did a lot of photo reconnaissance in North Vietnam. There were many famous targets, the Thanh Hoa Bridge, uh, things around Haiphong, Haiphong uh, Hanoi, and many other locations along the coast of uh, North Vietnam. But lo most of our missions actually were South Vietnam and um, Laos. We were flying over the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos. I can remember a lot of times our mission targets were things like um, a cache where there were supplies cached and we would go after that. Or maybe it would be a what we call a transshipment point where uh, munitions and supplies were being uh, moved from one vehicle to another or a supply camp where people were staging for moving further south into Laos or South Vietnam. So the targets, as the pilots used to say, it was just a pile of rubbish. I did go on a couple in uh, South Vietnam. I was not uh, allowed to go over the north. Uh, one thing I didn't, I guess I maybe knew too much. Uh, as an intel officer, you, you have information that people would want to know. And uh, so most of the flying I did was South Vietnam, and I think I went into Laos once. We had some rather non-routine kind of things, too. In 1969, the 
North Koreans shot down a Navy spy plane, an ECM-121. The plane involved was an unarmed constellation, propeller-driven. The mission was a reconnaissance mission. Now this was only a few months after the Pueblo. The USS Enterprise was on Yankee Station when that happened. We, the Kitty Hawk, were just pulling into Hong Kong for a week of liberty. I had been, I thought, smart and took the watch for the first day so I could kind of get that over with and have the rest of the week to uh, enjoy Hong Kong. Well, they sent the uh, Enterprise to Yankee Station, I mean to uh, Sea of Japan to operate up there, which meant we had to go to Yankee Station in the Gulf of Tonkin. So they pulled us out of Hong Kong with about six hours notice. We had put 2,000 sailors into Hong Kong early that morning. Six hours later, we were trying to get them all back. That was quite a feat. We left over 1,000, I'm told, uh, uh, sailors and people in Hong Kong. It took us about a month to get them all back aboard. After serving for 70 straight days on Yankee Station, they sent us to the Sea of Japan. And we operated up there for a month or so. We operated out of Sasebo, Japan, and we flew operations uh, in the Sea of Japan up along the Korean Peninsula. One of the things that uh, was a common occurrence there was that the Russians would send down their reconnaissance planes, uh, namely the Bears. It's a four-engine big plane. They would take off out of Vladivostok, fly over us and uh, take pictures and do their normal thing. Well, we knew when they took off in Vladivostok. So uh, I would scurry down. I was assigned the job of going down to CIC, the Combat, Combat Information Center, and uh, integrate via the liaison between CIC and IOIC, the intelligence community. So if they called general quarters, that meant I had to run very fast up three flights of stairs, get through three hatches and many doorways to get up to IOIC before they locked the door or the hatch. And there were a couple of times where I almost had to stand out in the hall during general quarters. This is Saigon, capital of a nation, heart and sinews of the gigantic American military command in Vietnam. So anyway, I got orders to go into Vietnam to outfit called Max Sod, Military Assistance Command Vietnam Studies and Observation Group, although it was better known as Max Sog Special Operations Group, because it was highly classified uh, joint service uh, unit. Specifically, I had three or four jobs. One was a North Vietnam intelligence officer, so I maintained order of battle for North Vietnam. I was a maritime operations intel officer, which meant I supported the, our maritime operations uh, with intelligence. I maintained the air order of battle for Laos, and uh, I was also the intel officer for another component of SOG called Joint Personnel Recovery Center, where we tried to get uh, recover downed pilots or rescue POWs, primarily in South Vietnam. Uh, and actually we did one in Laos. There was a rumor that there was a spy within SOG. I have no personal knowledge of that at all. But one thing that we did do um, on a routine basis was we always checked the toilets, even in our headquarters building, because the people that cleaned the building were Vietnamese. So you never trusted anybody. So there was an occurrence where somebody got injured by probably C5 being put in a toilet and blowing somebody up when they were sitting on the toilet. So we always checked the bowl, the tank, and the bowl uh, when we went into our toilets, even within the building, because you just never know. And in the same way in our BOQ, uh, you just never knew, because the people that took care of the building were, were Vietnamese. And uh, while you'd like to think you could trust them all, you certainly couldn't. When I got to Vietnam in the mid-1970s, there was a lot of barbed wire around Saigon. There were a lot of incidents still occurring of uh, jeeps being blown up and Americans being taken hostages and stuff. 
But shortly after I got there, uh, we had to work late one night. Curfew for Americans was 10 o'clock. Vietnamese was 11 o'clock. After curfew, I'm driving down. No other vehicles moving at all. I had to cross a series of railroad tracks to get to Cholon. So I'm driving up, and um, sure enough, there's a train blocking the track, the road. So I sit there for five or so minutes waiting. And shortly thereafter, two Vietnamese on their motorcycles drove up and parked within two feet of the passenger seat of my Jeep. I don't know how much time elapsed, but I imagine 10 minutes. And they're kind of joking around, talking and all. And I'm getting very concerned, feeling very vulnerable. And uh, I noticed one of them reaching back into his uh, knapsack on his motorcycle and the other one reaching behind inside of his pocket. So instinctively, I grabbed my 45 out of my holster and I pointed it right at his head. Keeping in mind, he was only two feet away from the Jeep. So my gun was right three feet from his head. And there was no doubt in my mind, if he had made any kind of move, what I would have done. And I guess he saw the fright in my eyes. So he just slowly raised his hands and the guy in the back did that and they slowly moved their motorcycle away. But that was my closest encounter and maybe nothing would have happened. Maybe it was totally innocent, but it scared the be Jesus out of me. I was given the Bronze Star because, as the Declaration says, I went far beyond my, the expectations of what I was supposed to be doing. I exposed myself to enemy fire. I exposed myself to a lot of hostile action, though it didn't result in a hand-to-hand -hand combat or any shoot 'em up if you will. Uh, I was exposed to a lot of things that uh, uh, could have been. And uh, they saw and recognized that and uh, awarded me the, the Bronze Star with V for Valor. Anyway, I served for three, uh, a year basically there. And I rotated out and uh, came back to the um, uh, Washington, D.C. and served for three months there. Uh, I had applied for Naval Postgraduate School, but the Navy, in its wisdom, could not decide if I was going to be accepted this year or next year or ever. So I decided to go back to graduate school at North Carolina State University in Raleigh, North Carolina. So I actually got out in August off of active duty and started immediately back into graduate school. And you would think that North Carolina would be a very welcoming site to Vietnam vets. It was for the most part, but there was an element there that I felt very put upon by being a Vietnam vet. And uh, if you wore your uniform on base, I mean on campus, there were those that would spit on you and ridicule you and mostly just call you stupid and dumb. And I have to say, I loved every minute that I was in the Navy, just because I think uh, we contributed. Uh, I'm proud to be a Vietnam veteran. I think we did good. Uh, you know, it gets so bad-mouthed, such a waste. You were so dumb and stupid to go there instead of going to Canada. No, I'm proud to have gone there. I'm proud of what we did and uh, proud that I served in the Navy and uh, proud to be a veteran.